So Collier and Hoffler's article was an influential first step at trying to get us to think about how economic factors shape decisions to go to civil conflict and the conditions that make it more or less likely. One of the factors I didn't really delve into that much in the previous video was what I mentioned was that conflict was bad for business, right? So as conflict drags on, economic growth goes down, and that should, I don't know if you thought at all about it when you were listening or when you read the paper, but right, if you are drawing a path diagram between economic growth or economic capacity and conflict, you can also think about whether the relationship is only that unidirectional or whether there is a potential feedback loop and uh, conflict can lead to lower economic growth and countries can just reach a state of uh, economic malaise or a lack of economic capacity that uh, that conflict uh, drives um, lack of capacity and capacity in turn drives conflict. And so in a lot of social science, you can think about factors in which A causes B, but also potentially B has an effect on A. And so one of the dilemmas and the difficulties in trying to understand the drivers of conflict, including economic capacity and economic incentives, is how to isolate that effect between economic factors and conflict while controlling for or isolating the uh, or avoiding the capacity of, of our models predicting or showing a relationship, but it's really driven by conflict leading to lower economic growth. And that brings me to the Miguel uh, et al. piece 2004 piece in which they come up with an instrumental variable approach at trying to look at economic growth and conflict to try to control for uh, or avoid the potential for the uh, relationship actually going the other direction, right? Uh, and their points, uh, their main points are that previous civil war models are flawed. Um, they don't appreciate that economics and violence are interrelated. We use a fancy term for that um, endogenous relationships or endogeneity. It is going to be an ongoing thread throughout this class that we always have to think about the direction of our relationships. Is A really causing B or potentially B also, uh, the relationship is largely driven by B uh, causing A. And there's also a number of significant factors that Miguel et al. think that are overlooked, i.e. omitted variables. This is also another uh, issue that we're going to see over the course of this semester, that uh, in order to understand the world, uh, which is incredibly complex, far larger than we could include all, all important factors in one article or one book, one paper, one lifetime that you have to abstract away from the messiness of reality, but that leads to decisions that others can question about whether you included everything that was relevant. So omitted variables are also something I want you to think about as you read papers because they could be important to your reading of the paper and what you might want to focus on in your own work to try to fill that gap of some other factor that you don't think is important to understand. So governmental institutional quality might affect both economics and the probability of violence. There's some other uh, exogenous force. A government is only really considered in Collier and Hoffler's article as a function of taxation, right, and uh, being able to get money out. But then, of course, you actually need to have institutions that work to be able to actually get the taxes, to know where economic production is happening. Um, and that is something that's not really discussed, that governments are assumed to be uh, in a frictionless manner getting taxes from people, but that's a questionable assumption as we saw in um, in the economic crash of 2007 and 2008. One of the difficulties in Greece with the economic crisis was that the governments needed money to be able to shore up the economic system and to make sure everyone's had, had jobs and to pay unemployment, but the tax rate there was incredibly low and people were rebelling against having to pay those taxes that were theoretically, well, owed uh, according to the rules um, because there were other informal institutions that suggest that it was okay to not uh, pay your full fair share of taxes for at least a part of the, uh, part of the government, uh, part of the state. 
I would say for this paper, we're going to be talking more about it in the discussion. Main contributions that, that I see and that the literature has taken away from it, they estimate economic shocks and conflict simultaneously. So instead of just having one formula, they have two, yay, more math, uh, but that they can run regressions that allow you to estimate both economic growth and conflict and be able to estimate what the relationship is between those two equations, right? Does conflict shape uh, economic shocks and does economic shocks shape conflict? And in order to do that, you need to be able to anchor one of those equations with something that's related to one factor but not another. Um, and they also include some uh, initiatives by including country fix effects and time trends. Um, Collier and Hoffler's models were cross-sectional. This includes time as well. And fixed effects or country dummies are just a fancy way of saying there are some things about Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea that we can't include perfectly everything about that country that matters about the probability of conflict. So we're just going to have some kind of dummy for that individual country and say all those observations about Australia or the U.S. Uh, are related to each other. Um, and that allows us to have more accurate um, uh, cross-national uh, comparisons over time. Substantive findings, they, they find a 5% decline in growth leads to a 12% increased probability of conflict in Africa. Um, which is consistent with other economic mar models, right? That as the economy gets tougher, that increases the probability of conflict. Now, if you look at the substantive effects, which I encourage all of my students to read both for the theory as well as the substantive findings, you see in this that as rainfall growth increases, the probability of conflict goes down. However, uh, the horizontal line doesn't show, oh, yeah, there it is, um, in this graph, but zero is when there's no relationship between um, rainfall growth and conflict. Um, and those those dotted lines are the confidence intervals, but you really only see a substantive effect of rainfall um, growth on conflict at really high levels of rainfall. Only in that red box there do you really see some of that uh, confidence interval being outside zero, which is basically a fancy way of saying the finding is driven by only those high level observations of high rainfall, high growth, which leads to decreased conflict. Those other countries um, that are in the two thirds of the distribution, there really isn't any relationship. So that finding that they have is only really driven by that high level um, uh, countries. And you have to wonder, you can look in the data and see what are those countries are they incredibly influential. And so when looking at instrumental variables, the way that they anchor that two equation model between growth and conflict is rainfall, right? It is due to rain today when I record this video. Canberra has had an incredibly moderate and um, temperate and uh, rainy summer so far this year, driven by the La Nina weather pattern. Um, but I think Rainfall is something that everyone can understand. Everyone has a large uh, lived experience with it. And so as an instrument for economic growth, right, rain is l not likely to lead directly to conflict. If we're really angry at each other, um, that uh, you might be more likely to go to war with each other. But uh, having that anger driven by rain is not something that we've seen. And so that's why they make an argument that rainfall is not related to conflict and only related to economic growth in Africa. Africa is in large part not irrigated. Over 90% of the uh, arable land is not irrigated. And they make an argument that um, rainfall is crucial to economic capacity in these African states. And so that's why that is a way to anchor that relationship between growth and conflict. However, I don't know. Um, I look forward, to, I, I keep meaning to buy one of those little weather stations in the back of my house so I can see what the weather is like and, and what's likely to happen in the future. But these large scale weather collection mechanisms that countries undertake uh, is a function of scientific capacity and economic capacity that there's vast inequalities between them. So one of the takeaways from this paper for me in reading it was um, 
what is that really can you tell a story that links rainfall or the measurement of rainfall uh, to conflict and it so happens that um, what 15 years after the Miguel, uh, Miguel et al piece came out there was another article that raised a question as to whether we can really believe this substantive substantively plausible relationship that was so incredibly influential in the Miguel et al piece uh, and weather stations are all around the world. They're even on Mount Everest. There was an, uh, a couple of, well, there's been a number of efforts at trying to measure the height of Mount Everest or Chongmaloma, um, Shishpa, um, uh, uh, Chongmaloma on the Nepali side. Um, God, I'm blanking on the, the Chinese word for, for it. Um, but either way, there's measures on uh, the South Coal, and there's also efforts to measure um the weather on the very top of Mount Everest. And so a lot of these, this looks like a really expensive uh, weather station. I don't know if I could afford that one. Maybe one of the little cheaper ones that I can get at Bunnings. But anyway, these are the kind of weather stations visually that you can see that people gather data from and report uh, them over time. And that is necessary to measure the rainfall patterns that Miguel et al. use to drive the relationship between economic growth and conflict. And this article by Ken Schultz and Justin Mencken, which came out a couple of years ago, really raised the question for whether temperature is exogenous to civil conflict. And this, I think, is a really creative um, paper that says, okay, the assumption that no one's really talked about for 15 years of the Miguel et al. piece is that um, the rain data are accurate and in no way shaped by conflict. And what they do is they look at the number of weather stations uh, in countries that have had conflict uh, in Africa and find out that conflict actually has an effect on our ability to gather weather data. And you can see over time the coverage of uh, the crew weather data. It's uh, just one of the couple of on the ground weather measurement systems. All the data are publicly available. It's a great public um, resource in case, uh, for rainfall and temperature we're gonna talk about in a, in a few months. But as you can see in the um, Sub-Saharan African context, the density of uh, weather station coverage in Africa has gone down dramatically from 1985 to 2015. And you can see in these areas in which they're active and defunct uh, weather stations that uh, huge swaths of the, co the continent just don't have any weather stations at all. And there's mathematical models to be able to estimate uh, what the weather is like in those areas where there isn't a weather station, but you see gaps of uh, in entire countries uh, or just entire geographic regions within countries. I mean, even what like uh, Tanzania only has a few uh, of the crew ones. They have more of the best, but there's still wide swaths of the country that doesn't have anything. And the argument is that conflict. Um, either makes people not stay in an area to be able to gather predictable weather information like rainfall for months or years at a time, or the government just doesn't have the money to be able to gather that information and to pay people to be there. Um, so you can make an argument whether it's at an individual level, people leaving, or governments to be able to have the capacity to put people there. You can make different arguments. But in the entire continent, of sub-Saharan Africa, there's barely as much um, weather stations as there is in New South Wales and the ACT. This is uh, a map as of 2020, but I downloaded the data um, as of a couple of days ago for New South Wales and ACT, and there's only over 5,000 uh, weather station gathering um, rainfall data on a day-to-day -day basis just in this one um, New South Wales and ACT region part of Australia. And so I think for me, when you read an article like Miguel um, et al., it's incredibly intuitive. Um, economic growth as it goes up should lead to decreased conflict. What could shape economic growth to make sure that the relationship's not the other way around, conflict leading uh, to negative economic growth, is you find some other factor. Nothing like uh, climate or the weather as something that's in the short term not related to conflict. And it shaped our understanding of it for 15 years and was cited well over um, thousands of times the Miguel piece was. 
and then you can kind of have clever academics uh, reading it and coming up with their own questions and say, really, do I do I buy that? Uh, so could there be something else going on? Is it an incomplete understanding of the way these things are related? And then they gather the data and come up with their models that suggest actually um, whether data are not necessarily exogenous, which has now pushed people to using satellite data on uh, gathering weather because that is less likely to be. I, I haven't heard of a rebel group that's been able to shoot satellites out of the sky, uh, touch wood. Um, but this is common to the study of social uh, science. It reminded me of another controversy um, from about a decade ago of the uh, economic, uh, by other um, economists, uh, these ones at Harvard, and they were incredibly influential in the policy community. Their study of economic growth was driven by their models that suggested at around 90% of government debt to GDP, economic growth really started to decline. So how much debt can a country live with? Kind of like us, how much debt can we live with? Um, is shaped by your ability to repay and uh, and what effect that money you spend on repayment has on not being able to spend money on other things. And it was an influential study. They went and gave talks in international organizations and at countries around the world. And then a couple of other um, academics, uh, including a grad student at a public school in Massachusetts, found a pretty basic error in their calculations in Excel and showed that once you fix that error, the relationship between debt to GDP uh, went away. And it's one of those things that hopefully highlights um, in, our, in our transition to try to understand this world without any inherent meaning on it uh, in a way that we would understand it. How do we put meaning on it? Like in the beginning, we were talking about political maps. In our studies of it, we have to think about our assumptions, the possibility for mistakes and accidents, and that all research is temporary and required a narrow set of assumptions. And so hopefully that should give you a bit of optimism in how you develop your own research questions and your possibility to contribute um, to the world. So that leads me to the end of this section and to the second lecture question. Uh, can you think of any endogenous relationships um, between conflict and another causal factor for conflict? Uh, we've already, I've touched here on economic growth, but can you think about what effect um, we might talk about as a driver of conflict that conflict can in turn affect. I've hinted at a couple last week, but I'd be interested to see um, if there's any that you've discussed so far. Please post your answers to Waddle uh, or in the comments section below. And now I'm going to turn to um, less about economic growth and national level aggregate GDP to more um, measures that get at poverty, the lack of capacity and the difference in capacity between uh, groups within society. So um, please uh, leave an answer for that question below if you, cho if you choose to, and let's start, a talk let's start talking about poverty and conflict.